Well, it's a beautiful Sunday morning and you're very welcome to Bealtaine Cottage here in the west of Ireland. Look at this wonderful rainbow. Isn't it fabulous? Mixed weather. April, of course. Remember the old saying, March winds and April showers bring forth May flowers. But what I want to talk with you about today, because it's sort of answering a question that so many of you have asked me about, Invasive species. So there are a lot of invasive species here in the British Isles and here in Ireland especially. So there's Japanese knotweed and Himalayan balsam and rhododendron, um, ragwort, giant hogweed. You know, um, a lot of various what's termed as invasive species. So here in the gardens of Bealton the Cottage, I have three, I suppose, that you would term invasive species. One is rhododendron, and I'm going to talk about that. The other one is Gunra manicata, and I'll talk about that. And the third one, which is quite invasive here, is um, a herb. It's actually a herb that was imported by the Romans into the British Isles. And it's renowned for all kinds of healing properties and is edible. And yes, you probably guessed it, it's ground elder. Now, ground elder was already here in a small capacity when I first um, moved here 20 years ago. And... Many people would get really upset about the ground elder and the way it spreads. But I've discovered quite a few things about invasive species. Ground elder is one of them that I want to share with you. So I'll start by describing... um, the first one on the list, which of course is Gunara manicata. So the Gunara manicata, I actually brought into the woodland gardens here as um, a beautiful plant to plant along the water's edge, because as you know, I have a lot of water from the spring well flowing through the woodland gardens. Now, I've managed to curtail it, to curtail its spread by the method that I use for virtually every invasive species. I plant it out, which means I sort of push it out by planting. And planting trees and shrubs and kind of hemming it in. You know, when you have something dangerous, you want to hem it in. You want to stop it from moving. You want to stop it from spreading. And that's basically what I've done with the Gunara manicata. And as you will see in this video, the Gunara manicata is there on a little island in the ponds. And there's little bits of it planted around the pond, but it's very hemmed in. In fact, in fact, I have noticed that it has decreased rather than invaded. It's decreased and in fact some of the little isolated plants alongside the pond where it could possibly spread seem to be doing very badly. They're really struggling to make something of themselves. So let me move on now to the second uh, plant that I mentioned, which is the rhododendron. Now, there's many varieties of the rhododendron, but the one which is considered invasive is the rhododendron ponticum. That's spelled P-O-N-T-I-C-U-M, ponticum. And it's a common rhododendron, and it's a species of the flowering plant um, uh, um, Ericaceae. So it's native to the Iberian Peninsula in southwest Europe and the Caucasus region in northwest Asia. 
So first of all, it actually thrives in ericaceous soil, so acid-loving soil, hence the, fam um, hence the family name of the plant, ericacea. So, of course, where it is planted in the soil is just going to rump away, it's going to thrive. So you can, of course, uh, bring the pH balance in your soil to a more acceptable level, which is not acceptable to the rhododendron. Or you can simply again plant it out and that is curtail its spread by planting around it. Now I've been here 20 years so I've got 20 years of experience with these plants and I have managed to do exactly that. So the rhododendron ponticum which I have down in the middle woodland and has been there for 19 years has not spread. So that's two avenues that you could explore with invasive rhododendron. But can I say, actually, before I leave this particular plant subject, when you cut the rhododendron, you've got the most magnificent hardwood, which is incredible for um, helping to build roundhouses, helping to build rustic fences and archways. It's a very good wood. Of course, before I move on to the ground elder, let me also say that, you know, if you have a plant which is spreading beyond how you want it to spread, then it really is up to the gardener or the person in charge of the land to get in there and do some hard work. So, as well you know, I don't shy away from hard work. So let's move on to the ground elder. Now the ground elder is actually an incredible herb. It was um, apparently introduced by the Romans to Britain as a, as a sort of a pot herb and uh, used in herbal medicine, traditionally used for gout and uh, of course the Romans suffered a lot with gout because they used to have these great feasts and they used to overeat. They would lie on couches and eat until they vomited. Uh, they used to have something called a vomitorium. <laughs> I know it's too disgusting to even think about it, but there you go. That's how it was. Um, but it's really good to treat rheumatism and arthritis. You know, all these... All these problems related to gout, um, bladder issues and digestive conditions and um, makes great poultices as well. And, but it spreads. It is a very pernicious sort of herb. It spreads everywhere. However, the fact that I have it in my upper woodland, which is directly outside the cottage at the front, and then it's moving along through the woodland and going up as far as the path. You know the path from the back of the cottage to the polytunnel? It hasn't moved across that path. So that's something else that I've noticed. A well-walked path will stop the actual spread of ground elder. Now again, I speak from 20 years of experience. I'm not talking to you from... Um, a horticultural um, um, book or a horticultural um, sort of lesson that I've learned. I'm talking to you from my own experience and I think that is the ultimate permaculture um, magic, if you like, because you're observing nature. This is the Gunara Manikata, by the way, look on that little island. So we'll move on to the ground elder. First of all, um, its roots are not too deep. Now they're very kind of clumpy, you know, they'll kind of clump up in the soil and they can be difficult to remove. And most of them are sort of joined to each other, but you would have to dig over the soil completely and tease out every little bit of root you know, it's a bit like the morning glory. You have to get every little bit. So what I do, 
I leave it alone. I put plants into it. Trees, shrubs, where the roots go down deeper than the ground elder. And slowly, slowly, the ground elder is pushed out or minimised. Now, you're never going to get rid of it completely because it really is a very invasive plant. But you live with it. How do I live with it? Well, during May, it comes up in the most beautiful white flowers. And that delicate floral display is worth every minute of annoyance with that plant. (laughs) Now, isn't it interesting talking about invasive species? How much those invasive species bring to the table, not just culinary table, but the table of our own health and prosperity. So, for example, ground elder um, contains vitamin C and pro-vitamin A and the minerals calcium and magnesium and um, potassium and salicylic acid. And all these are really good for removing acid from the blood which helps to alkalise our own systems. So arthritis gout and many of the other afflictions that are caused by elevated acid levels in the blood will be helped enormously. And also the intestines benefit from the power of ground elder. But hey, stop me, because I'm now starting to talk about herbs. And I intend doing some videos on herbs because I'm a huge believer in herbs. And those of you who have um, seen the way that I've grown my salads will know that a salad isn't a salad unless it has lots of herbs in it. So just as a little addendum, I want to show you some of the work I've been doing stemming the flow of another little invasive plant, which is the beautiful fuchsia which grows a bit crazy here in the west of Ireland, by the way. So I'm just here um, cutting back the fuchsia. You can see how huge it's grown. And um, yeah, a bit out of breath now. I'm not too sure how low to cut it. I think it's going to be about there. Yeah, about there. So I'm just taking down all the heavy branches. You can see on the other side of the fuchsia, between the laurel and the fuchsia, is a, is a I think it's a green beech. It might be a purple one, but it's been kind of squashed in there, you know, because uh, I think I planted the fuchsia first, just stuck a bit in the ground, you know. And um, then about a year later, I think I planted the beech. And then the laurel, as you can see, the laurel's got massive, but that's okay, because that's a really good windbreak. The fuchsia will grow again like bilio, and that's another good windbreak, you know. And, uh, yeah, hoping to get lots and lots of flowers on it this year. Well, I do every year, but, you know. Right, back to work. So, I've managed to get all this, um hard pruned and uh, yeah totally exhausted now I'm going to go up to the house and make myself a cup of strong coffee because actually the hardest part of this was dispersing all the bits around the woodland you know I have what I call habitat piles that's one of them there but that's got rather big so I will have to do a little bit of chop through that and then, and then just leave it to settle because the birds will nest in there and other little creatures. In fact, there's already something that looks a bit like a, a little nest going on there, in there. It's wonderful to be down here in the woodland, you know, just working in the woodland. Everything's so green. And the birds are singing. It's lovely. <laughs>